Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Inevitable Podcast. Uh, today I have the honor and pleasure of having Mr. Lucas Lima here with me. Um, and um, Lucas works at uh, Astella, which is uh, a venture capital firm in Brazil that invests in Brazilian companies. And I, um, I've had a pleasure of uh, yet to meet you in person, uh, but uh, mostly through Twitter. And I find that uh, for me, at least as an investor, having done this for almost a decade now, it's, um, it's really important to observe and look into, you know, who are, like, you know, who's a part of the next generation of investors in uh, globally that, you know, you can learn something from. So uh, for me, it's actually great to be here so I can learn from you. I observe people that I think, you know, you show and that have demonstrated the same level of uh, intellectual obsession that I have about the world and about what we do for a living. So it's a pleasure to have you here. And I hope we're going to have a, a wonderful conversation, you know. Pedro, uh, I'm honored by your words. I'm honored to be here. As you know, I'm a big fan of you. So since I entered in this market, in the venture capital market, six years ago, I've been reading and following all your content. So for me to be in the Inevitable Podcast, it's a big honor. It's great. We're happy to have you here. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I'd love just to, you know, learn more about you. I mean, in terms of... Um, um, how did you, you know, like a little bit about your childhood, how did you grow up and um, when did, when it was the beginning of the journey for you when you noticed that you cared about um, technology, about entrepreneurship and so forth? Yes, let's go. So I'm from a small city in the northeast of Brazil. I'm from Aracaju and I have a really, really happy childhood. So I, I was fortunate to have a happy and really united family. I have a older sister and a younger brother. And I would describe my childhood as really energetic. So I was really, really into sports. So I played, for example, tennis in a high level. I played some national tournaments and I played a lot of sports, a lot of soccer. So I was a really energetic child and my house was always full of friends, full of people. And another thing important, another important thing about me is that I have always been really, really curious about everything. So I do remember that since I was a little kid, like seven, eight years old, I started to read Veja weekly. Mm -hmm. So I have for, great for, memories. For those who don't know, if you're dad, not Brazilian. Yeah, Veja is what like be like what the Time maybe Time magazine of the of, of of Brazil, and at some point, before most most you know journalists and press went to shit, um, it was a reputable publication when when you were reading, I would say. Yes, yes. Uh, so I, I do have great memories, you know, around my dad and my granddad and his friends and talking about adult things like politics and economics when I was young. And another important thing is that even I am from a small city in Brazil, I have some kind of open-minded creation from my parents. So I, I am not rich, but I have a, a, we, we have a good financial condition. And since I was really young, my parents did uh, an annual trip with us to outside Brazil. So this made me more aware and more open to new culture, new people. And when I was 15, for example, I lived for a month in London. When I was 16, I lived for a month in Toronto. And I think that's really important to my life. And that's one of the root reasons why I decided to move from a small city in the Northeast to go to Sao Paulo to go to the world. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. But then when was the time when you realized, for instance, uh, uh, what was your major in college or ultimately, you know, I find it interesting when I, what, what is going through people's minds in moments of um, long term decision making, meaning uh, where do you go to college? Wh what city do you decide to live? Who do you want to go work for in, or under certain moments in your life? These are all uh, interesting questions, at least uh, that, that I care when, when meeting founders and or other people in general, of course. Um, so, uh, maybe how was that for you until you, um, became a, a, a venture investor or, or realized that look like I want to do venture for a living. 
uh, I think the f the first the first important mark was when I decided to be in the entrepreneurial world, and I don't remember like exactly moment, but my my father he is entrepreneur, and he have been uh, entrepreneur since I was born, so. I was a witness of the ups and downs of the entrepreneurial life. I was a witness of the roller coaster. And since then, I just wanted to be close to entrepreneurs and, or to be an entrepreneur by my own or to work alongside entrepreneurs because I was a big fan of the adventure, of the uncertainty. But uh, I, I came from a family that part of it, it works in in the states as a prosecutors as a ju as judges and you know my father is the exception he broke the mold and he decided to be entrepreneur and and even with the uncertainty of this life yes. what is he his was business so motivated and he has a medium sized industry that transforms steel into consumer products for the the less the the lowest uh, income population of Brazil. So he transforms his steel into chairs, kitchens, desks. And oh, interesting. Actually, he, uh, so, so he was always so motivated. He had such a work ethic and he was so optimistic and so driven to purpose that I, I knew I wanted to have adventure with people like him or adventure like him. So he was a deeply influenced. So when it was the come to decide to which university I would, I would like to go, I decided to go to FGV. That's the most important business school in Brazil. And it was no brainer to me to go to the best one. So he, 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 he was a deep, a, a big influence for me. That's great. That's great. Yeah. It's funny for me, the, the same thing happened. You know, my, uh, my mother, um, was an entrepreneur as well. She, she's an entrepreneur. Uh, she has a video production company and I think that, uh, but we couldn't afford a nanny. And then, you know, so ultimately I spent a lot of time at the office just uh, watching them, uh, you know, watching her, watching her have meetings and uh, have like this somewhat like a busy lifestyle and so forth. And, you know, frankly, like that was my reality. So I felt that like, you know, that was kind of like what I was supposed to do when I remember the first times in life where something that it, it motivates me to this date, which is um, every time that I would complain or cry about something or just, you know, have a little bit of like a bit, bitchy attitude, uh, my mom would say, um, uh, do you want to be the kid that's crying or you want to sell some tissues? <laughs> and, and, and for whatever reason, you know, every time I go through some sort of trouble or difficulty or something like that, um, I always remember, I was like, no, I'm a tissue salesman. Uh, I, uh, uh, so uh, let's just sell tissues. And um, so, so I, I find that just having parents that are entrepreneurs is, 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 is very important because um, people, I think they, 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 they undercalculate risk in life. And they find, they think yes. that they need to be following a certain pattern and it's so wrong. And it's just because we've been indoctrinated, right? Like, I mean, uh, would you like your kid as a, I don't know, a 16 year old to be a well-known, well-reputable Twitch streamer or just a regular high school kid, you know? So it's like uh, these opportunities of self-actualization are just coming up earlier and earlier in the lives of um, of young younger people. Um, that I and I think it comes from just having a, a family with an entrepreneurial mindset. And my parents, I would say, like they don't have the most healthy relationship with money, not because they do reckless stuff, it's the opposite. They're actually very disciplined, uh, but they just they are fearful of not having money. And I think that that's not usually the right way to think about it. Um, you just got to do things on a risk adjusted basis. Uh, but anyway, that's a whole nother story. Yes, but that's pretty interesting. I had the same attitude at home, you know. And in, when when I was growing, all this uncertainty and the rewards and the risks and this roller coaster that's to be entrepreneur, uh, it was in my house, and I, I just wanted to be engaged around entrepreneurs. 
because it, they, they are so motivated and they have so many challenges, but they are so motivated and that's really important for me. Great, interesting. So then, but like, when was the first time you got in touch with Venture? And, um, and how old were you and how old are you now? Uh, I'm 26 now. And the first time I got in touch with Venture, like when I started to work, I was 20 or 21. I don't actually remember the exact age. And, you know, during, during the university, I co-founded with other, other people the Entrepreneurship League. That's a hub of knowledge, a hub of um, content about tech, about startups, of mentorships in FGV. And it, it was like before the mainstream of venture capital and before the mainstream of startups in Brazil. But we were able to bring some, some entrepreneurs to, to mentorships. For example, we... We were able to invite David Velez when he was in the Series B, Series C round of Nubank. And we we met, for example, Pedro and Eric from Brax when they were just starting Pagarmi. And we it was the first time that I, I, I get to know more about venture capital. And... I I went for for uh, exchange. I lived in Milano for six months, mm -hmm. and when I returned from the exchange, I ah, have to decide. Anche parla what italiano. Uh, well, uh, un, un poco. Uh, my Italian, my Italian sucks, really, man. I see. Okay. <laughs> okay. Io sono really, cittadino really italiano. Io parlo un po' di italiano. Okay. We can we can switch to <laughs> English. Our second no, no. language, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> io parlo non molto bene. Andiamo in inglese. Uh, All right. But so 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 I had to decide, and I had like two options. One was okay, I'm going to to co-found a company, or I want to go to some place that I want to learn a lot. And I could go for a startup or I could go for a venture capital firm. Actually, I had a friend that worked in a top tier venture capital firm, which was 2017. And when he, which firm? he told me about the routine, I said, okay, Monashis. Monashis. And, and so it was 2017, the market was less than $1 billion, the volume on the investment in Brazil during that time. So it, it was like 10 times smaller than what it is right now. And I said, okay, I'm going to learn a lot working in venture capital. So I started to cold call all the venture capital firms <laughs> because the, you know, in this, in this market, there is no job posting. So I started to send a lot of messages in the LinkedIn And I, I, I was really lucky to be hired by Fundo Pitanga. That's a deep tech firm that I've worked for a year. So that was my first contact. But at that time, I didn't have this conscious of, I want to be a VC. This, my life will be to be a venture capital investor. I was not aware, but I fell, I fell in love after that. When I started Interesting. Yeah, I think, I mean, let's just break that apart a little bit in the sense that... Um, I got my job at Funders Club um, through another position that they were trying to hire, which was for an LP relations position. But before my first interview, I had already interviewed 34 different CEOs written in two different investment memos. This is before my first phone screen. And then I sent all of that to them with fully well-written notes and so forth. And they were just like, uh, who is this kid? Uh, but I knew that I had to brute force my way into the front door to eliminate all the kids from Stanford and Harvard that were in the funnel. Uh, because I've, I've contemplated many times doing the MBAs. Uh, this is a whole nother conversation. I still think it's a net positive. It's just not something that will suit me personally because of my personality, but just um, um, an opportunity cost. I mean, there's just like a whole nother thing there, but, um, and I'm very fortunate uh, for Boris and Alex at Funnel School, they gave me a chance as, as long as, alongside uh, Jared Engelberg, that now it's the CEO of Cold Cove, a company I funded. Um, that, um, but basically, you know, the beautiful thing about venture is that everyone can be an investor. The barrier of entry is zero, but the barrier of uh, permanence is very high, very high. 
And I think, unfortunately, a lot of people just they're like in this in-between stage for a long time because it just takes a long time to understand if you are a good investor or not. Um, and it's only over when you return capital in the bank. It's what uh, uh, Chris Dovos, this is an experienced LP, says only when the moolah is in the kula because you cannot yes. eat paper returns, you can't eat IRR. So um, I even just share something here on the record just in november i sold a bunch of things on the secondary markets and uh at full price which was great it was, i think that the exaggeration already at macro was uh tremendous and we were like we gotta take risk off the table because this is going to collapse and um i never thought that the i thought that by this at this point russia would already have won the war never thought that the resi the ukrainians would be so resilient um, and not that I would be financing this war with my taxes as well, which is unfortunate. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, we, we, you know, we, 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 we were really considering. We we're like, hey, I think this is going. To, they're going to start a war. Um, so, but I was going back to what we were talking about. I think. Sorry, I just got into this weird tangent. Uh, how to get a job in venture, right? If you're young, um, you got to work hard. You gotta hustle. The best jobs are not listed. You need to build these relationships and immediately, unapologetically, unapologetically, just put yourself in front of these people and prove to them yes. that you are interesting, that you can teach them something without being arrogant, right? So how did you do that yes. for Pitanga? Yes, so uh, I really like one phrase from Mark Suster and he says something that to get a job in venture, you need that, that you 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 need two of three things so timing luck or relationship because timing the teams of venture capital firms are are, are small so one people more one people less change the dynamics so you have to find the right time to enter in a place you need luck and of course you need relationships so when a, when 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 a job is open you could be hired uh, the, the, the only thing that you can control in these three variables it's relationships so you have to you have to to go outdoors and start to build relationships with people in the metro capital area mm -hmm. uh, when i was starting in pitanga in 2017 uh, i have to say that venture capital in brazil wasn't as hot as it is today so all my friends the most brilliant were going to investment banking we're going to to private equity and consulting firms, but I, I was almost the only one that went for a venture capital role. And for for for, for perspective, right now a lot of friends are going to uh, are are asking me how to go into venture because venture got mainstream in Brazil. But you have to be really passionate about. You know, I I don't think that a venture capital firm expects someone that is already read for something is it read for writing checks but a venture capital firm is always expecting for someone that is really curious and have a really passion for entrepreneurship that really likes it this the, the job so you have to have a background that proves that in my in, in my life my background was the entrepreneurship league so the the foundation that i co-founded and I created and has a legacy and is still running. That that was my entry point. But right now I think that the, the bar is higher. So I, I think that content is one of the best ways to prove that you are interested inside the market and you can really understand inside the market. Of course I'm talking about a junior perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. But in the end, uh I will summarize that in a less polite but more direct way is that no one gives a fuck about the fact that you exist the universe owns you nothing yes. and you better prove your value meaning you know i, I, I like uh tim o'reilly right like uh you know, Chris, he says you got to open sources about adding more value than what you yes. can capture that's what you have to do to build relationships with people you give them first uh, and you expect nothing in return and then good things happen to you just do that on a consistent basis and, uh, and that's it, it's very simple. But yet again, I think you find a lot of these people uh, that just think that they deserve your time and they're wrong. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, it's just yes. interesting um, 
you know, and it's a process and I think it forces you to just be consistent and so forth. But, um, you know, so then you work there for a little bit. Uh, Pitanga, for those that don't know, is basically it's one of those branded family offices, right? Like they are operated as a fund, but it's, you know, anchored by two to three Brazilian billionaires. This is not a disparagement in any way, shape or form. It's just a very specialized firm. Imagine if uh, three Brazilian billionaires started Lux Capital with the name of a tropical fruit uh, that that's basically the summary um, great investments but like you know probably what we were making what one or two investments a year just a lot of thesis yes. a lot of calls right it wasn't it was a different pace completely and it was focused on deep tech the thesis was we aren't going to f to fund the most innovatives in terms of science latin america companies that's a really hard thesis to do in latin america because we Unfortunately, we, we don't invest so much in science and we don't encourage our scientists to be entrepreneurs. Uh, but that's the main thesis of Pitanga. And we were really successful in one of the investments at Satellogic. That's a company that yeah. right now is listed in NASDAQ. They did a SPAC last year. And, and, and that, that's the main case, the most important case of Pitanga. And, but it was like my school in life. I have to say it. I have so much gratitude because uh, both Fernando and Gabriel, the general partners, both of them taught me about deafness. And I think that they changed me in, in a way because I, after, after that experience, I was always searching for deafness because they are really, really deaf people. So they really like to understand the, te the thesis of any company in a really, really deaf way in a profound way. So that was my school and it was a really great experience. And I really like it to work a, a, a side by side with academics and more more technical entrepreneurs also. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I've, I've never, I have a very good friend of mine, Sunil Nagaraj is the founder of uh, Ubiquity, um, left Bessemer and started, you know, and he does a bunch of deep tech stuff. And there's also, uh, uh, what's the name of that guy that was from uh, from Vinci? Uh, is a Brazilian guy that is a fund of funds that also does direct investments from. It's like a Pactual guy. I forgot his name. Uh, Gary, I think. Um, oh my god. He's an LP actually in uh, Sumo's guy funds. Perlman. Guy Perimer. That's right. That's guy, right. That's guy. right. Yes, that yeah, brilliant yeah, guy. He writes for Sada. smart. Very, very smart guy. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't know. His book I don't, is amazing. I, I, uh, yeah, I, I haven't seen the, the book, but just, uh, just uh, I met with him a few times. V brilliant person. and um, But he does that globally, right? So I find that uh, just uh, doing that locally, it is, it is a shame, like you said, that's like we just don't invest enough for people uh, to take risk. So it's interesting then how many deals have... Uh, have you guys done all right how were you guys identifying deep tech opportunities throughout latin america and since pitanga was one of the only that look up for this thesis and we got at that time a lot of inbound and cold calls um, from entrepreneurs and other venture capital firms other investors also connected us and we were pretty close to institutions like FAPESP. That's a scientific institution from the government of Sao Paulo that financed a lot of studies. So we, we could call a lot, a lot of academics to talk about the opportunity to talk, okay, there is an opportunity to create something from this product. So sometimes we, we even encourage some entrepreneurs to to create to build a company not only build a, a scientific project but uh, it, it was a small universe and we were really close to the incubators from other cities and from uh, universities in brazil also got it interesting um no oh yeah satellogic is a great investment and i think i like um it's a very important thing for the world. So always a lot of respect for, for folks that uh, that have that deep thesis. And probably, I, I think that one thing that when you think about starting your venture career in an environment like that is that makes it interesting is that you just get a lot of time to research and study, um, you know, and, 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 and just reading 
and having a quiet mind yes. with concentration and focus is so important in order to start building the mental muscles for, for venture. For me, at least, you know, there's this book called Great Artist uh, Steel. And that whole thing about venture being an apprenticeship business and so forth. I mean, today I have my own style, but it wasn't, you know, day one that you formed that style. And I basically stole from a bunch of people by learning through what they were posting and the videos that they were, you know, doing. Uh, we are so fortunate to be doing this when, you know, we have the internet, where there's just so much knowledge out there. So anyone that doesn't say that they can't do anything, in my mind, they're just either, they're lazy, um, you know, or, or a little unlucky. And uh, luck is so important as well. So, but yes. in the end, uh, yeah, my favorite quote is that Seneca quote is like, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And, uh, but what I did in order to really learn ventures, like I, got, I, I, I fell in love with the business. And I was just kind of like, oh wow, I, I, feel, I felt like, uh, I was 27 at the time, so almost your age. And it, uh, so a little, much later, I would say, you know, so, uh, but just um, it answered that question, which I think it's the most important question in life, which is kind of like, uh, what is it that you like to do that you feel like you're a little bit better than other people that the world needs right now and yet you still want to put a lot of effort into it that is the most important question in life um and um for me that that's venture capital and what i did was i looked into all the um, the the folks that were listed on the midas list when i started a funders club and every weekend i had a goal of like breaking apart one individual so it's like, oh, I'm going to learn everything about Peter Fenton from Benchmark. Who is he? How he, did he get started? What were the deals that he did that didn't work out? Deals that he that worked out? What was his background? Oh, okay, let's let's learn about Doug Leon. Let's learn about uh, Byron Dieter. And then every single uh, week, um, you know, I would just learn about someone new. And um, and then until you, you develop your own style, right? Uh, so, so, so that was just uh, uh, quite, uh, quite helpful. I think that the most important thing and the hardest thing is that uh, sometimes you just have to be in a deprecated position from a salary standpoint for entry level positions. And that I think is the true economical gap. Because, you know, I mean, my name is Pedro I'm, and I'm Brazilian. I really don't care about any of the minority Latino stuff conversations. I don't subscribe to that reality. I believe that if you are in a business of investing, you just got to be good. And there are many people that have Latin American backgrounds that have succeeded in this business. We've got Santi Subotovsky at Emergence. There's Orlando Bravo that founded Toma Bravo. I mean, they are just countless. And I don't see them screaming angry on Twitter talking about, you know, these types of things there's always a way but i find that um to get an entry-level position oftentimes some, sometimes people are not getting paid they're not getting paid enough and you're at that point in life where kind of like if you grew up in a in a in a, in a less privileged economical position how the hell you're going to sustain yourself i think that is a true problem that needs to be solved uh because it, it is uh, uh i hope to be able to do that because I do think that you can, you know, at some point, um, whenever we have enough success uh, and so forth, I think that is interesting. But uh, but then let's let's walk through then your transition from from Pitanga Deep Tech dedicated fund, with you know only three LPs, um, to uh, Astella and and a little bit more about what you're doing uh, uh, today. So you you know you were doing it there. You realize, hey, I actually want to become a professional investor versus uh, starting a company. Was that a realization you've had when you were at Pitanga? Uh, so uh, I was at Pitanga, and I st it was like 2018, and I started to invest in cryptocurrencies, in ICOs, initial coin offerings. During that time, I was investing with a few friends, and. We were successful because everyone was was successful at that moment in the market because it was like a bubble in the ICO market. But I was able to win some money. And one friend of mine that's senior than I, he decided to create a, a, a venture capital firm, and an investment firm, not venture capital, investment firm focused on ICOs. And I was so passionate about blockchain that I decided, okay, I will join you and I will be full time working on blockchain projects to invest in blockchain projects, in, to invest in initial coin offerings. Uh, because 
I, I just saw opportunity. I said, okay, I will go and I will see, I, I, I will be an entrepreneur for a while. And I was pretty excited. And after I became full-time in, in blockchain, two months later, the ICO bubble crashed. Just That's crashed. Crazy. It's as so, if you just, yes. like right now also, right? We are, you know, an interesting moment. Exactly, exactly. So there is no more money, no LPs, no full-time. Uh, so there is no fund. So that was one of the first big challenges of my life because I was working in a place that I really loved, that I was learning a lot, and I decided to go to a place that it, it, it wasn't just successful. So I decided to go to the other side of the table. So I started to work on a startup, a blockchain startup as a business development, as a, a, a biz dev. And I was working designing tokenomics and other things. But after a while, I decided to leave this company because I think that I didn't fit really well into the culture. And, and but I it didn't fit well, sorry, it didn't fit well into, into the overall culture of that specific place or the overall culture of like crypto ICO-ness because there, that is its whole, like its whole thing as well. Um, which now the difference is that like, you know, maybe like no more ICOs, now we got NFTs. It's the same vibe. I've been to both parties. Yes, yes. I think both, not not only the company, but also the company and the market. But it was just a lot of bullshit into uh, ICOs and the blockchain in Brazil. The, only, the most successful uh, people in this market was the exchanges so uh, and traders. But... I wasn't witnessing really tech being developed into the market. So I confess that I was tired of blockchain because I, 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 I was missing to, to follow all the markets, other, in, other innovations. Uh, but before that, I decided to take some time for myself. And I worked like four months by my own as a consulting, working with my father for a while and helping other friends. Uh, and every day I was, read, I was reading articles about tech, about uh, venture capital, and I was listening podcasts about venture capital, about startups, about founders. I was, uh, many times I was listening like a Stella podcast, a Stella Playbook podcast. So I said, Okay, this is something different. I'm, I'm using my free time to listen about venture capital. I think I, I, I love this. So I want to return to the game. And then I, I started a course. I went to a course on, on venture capital. And one of the guests was, uh, was Laura, one of the partners of Estella. And during, during the, like, and, and during the lecture, uh, we went for a coffee. And I said to her, okay, I want to work at Estella. And I went to work there. And I will, after a few coughs, I was hired. So I was the first employee of Astella. And that was the way. And when I started Astella, after a few weeks, I was sure that I wanted to be a venture capital investor, a professional investor. And, and I, 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 I just love the routine. I love to be uh, side by side with entrepreneurs. I love to study the thesis. But that was the moment that I realized it too that I wanted to be for life a venture capital investor, a tech investor. Interesting. And then how did you get started? I think it's it's important also to just uh, share a little bit more with um, other folks. You know, what is early life in a in a venture firm? If you are the very first employee, so it's clear already that. There was no job description. You were just curious. You called the email. You went after building your own path. No one was there. You know, oh yeah, let me look into what's happening. Um, and and then took multiple encounters and so forth. And probably you were willing to do whatever was necessary. So uh, uh, what were some of the glorious, glamorous first tasks that you were doing in the beginning, if you want to share with us? Yes, of course. Man, I did everything that you can imagine. So I, 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 I had experience like because I worked at Pitanga, but I did everything that you can imagine from due sourcing, from first conversations with um, entrepreneurs, due analysis. That's the, the glorious part. 
but I had to do a lot of back office stuff also because as a fund you have to report to the to the commission the CVM in Brazil that's the the, the, the that's an institutional organ and I, I I just had to do anything that it was needed right so uh, I I was I, I was the only employer for almost a year with four partners and my job was I will do anything that is possible to help them and uh, to focus on the most important tasks that's the due investment and the fundraising that 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 uh, every day I was thinking on that and like after one year we hired more and more people and ju just after that that I started to publish like content and other things and I started to reflect more on the market because the first year I was so focused on the operation side that I I it, it was like a real inflection moment at Astella. We we were just we just raised our third fund and we were started to raise our first. So that was the main focus, the priority at the time. Great, that's great. No, but for instance, so I'll, I'll uh, what were some of I don't think I mean you, you talked a lot, but you didn't really answer the question directly. Sorry, just the, what were some of the things you were doing? I think it's important for people to know, like we're updating the CRM, doing the like what were like how does how how does one get started and like how does your day looks like in the first year of being the first employee of a venture capital firm that's you know starting out or is in its in its early days? Just that I think it's just an interesting thing for people to know. Because you probably, um, you know, not for, at least for me, let me, I'll, I'll walk you through. I was so scared. I was intimidated about the work, but at the same time faced it with courage. And I'm so grateful that I've had uh, Jared Engelberg and Boris there to help me understand, be patient, guide me through. And we also had a lot of freedom at the firm, um, which is why I ended up, you know, investing in Pipeify and Rappi, um, Aircall, Rapid API in the early days. Um, so I'd just love to learn, like, you know, well, how, how was your routine? What was your, you know, day look like? And how did you, do, yeah, no, I guess that was the, the question. Great. Uh, I, I would divide my day into three blocks. So the first one is the deal flow and analysis. So for, for, from the first chat with entrepreneurs, to from due sourcing to due analysis to uh, quantitative analysis from mem and investment memos so that's a pretty important part of the job the second part the second block is the portfolio support so um, probably someone that enters in, in venture capital you work side by side with partners and you are some kind of listening in the boards and in, in meetings with entrepreneurs and mm -hmm. you, tr you try to help them with fundraising and other tasks that it's necessary. And you sometimes you have some internal jobs to do, like you have to follow the financial evolution of the companies. And probably it's it's the job, not from a partner, but from a non-partner, an analyst or associate. And the third part is usually the bureaucratic one that you probably have to do also. So. You have to, as a venture capital firm, you have to report to LPs, you have to report for institutional, um, for, for, for institutions. So you have to, uh, yeah, that's a part of your daily job. Probably as a junior or a mid-level, you won't be working at fundraising. So that's, that would be the fourth block. But I would divide Great. my day in the first year as in these three blocks. I see. And then when was the time when you were just, have you at this point led from start to finish deals at Astella? And if so, which ones? Um, yes, but side by side with with other people. But one, one investment that I'm pretty proud is Cayena. It's a B2B marketplace. So like... Two years ago, I started to see the trend of B2B marketplaces in, in all around the world. And I wrote an article about it. And this article became not famous, but relevant inside the industry. And I was able to talk with almost all the entrepreneurs in the B2B marketplace space. And one of the entrepreneurs, um, that, 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 that was a ignite of the conversation with Kayena. And that's great. And, and, and that was one series that I'm, I'm a big believer. 
I research it a lot. I talked with almost all the players, and that that's investment that I'm super close. And in the same in the, this year, they raised it around the Fivine Ventures, a Series A of twelve million dollars. And nice. of course, there are other investments that I'm I'm working closely, and I have participated through all the cycle. Yeah, not no, a, but this uh, is good. A, I think it's an interesting. No, oh, go ahead. Not all the cycle because there is, of course, the exit, but through this investment cycle. No, sure, but I mean that you naturally sourced. I think it's just it's just so important as well that you know put an intention out in the universe and ultimately again add more value than what you can capture. So like you've had an opinion, and that's what I think investment is. You know, just specifically early stage venture capital is about having an opinion about the future. And if you get it right before others, you make more money, um, and um, which is a very important portion of what we do. Um, I, I when I look into the younger generation of investors, which I, I'm there as well. I haven't had a full fund cycle yet. You know, I'm about to start there. That's the other thing. It just the uh, people they don't realize the importance of that. No LP will care about the glory stories if you have not performed. No one cares. So it's just. Um, but in the beginning, you gotta be opinionated enough to say people um, stamp yourself out there towards like a, what makes your brand associated with the firm's brand. Because these are two distinctive things. Um, interesting enough for the highest caliber of entrepreneurs, which usually will have choices, they will pick you. It's not the opposite, you know. And for me, at least, my, I, my, my personal brand has always been this combination of hard work and spirituality. And it's kind of just like, like you, you're with someone that within certain disciplines will do whatever it takes for you to succeed which is fundraising, hiring, and uh, public relations. These are the three things that you know we, we add value uh, enormously. And then the fourth one now, which is something related with the model and how we do things at Atman, which is about spirituality, self-actualization, and wealth management. Uh, but the 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 that's 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 typically it. Uh, so you know, and then of course you have themes that you care more about. Um, so aside from B2B uh, uh, marketplaces, for instance, are there other things that you think are the future that you deeply care about intellectually, that you're curious? And I'm so curious about network effects and about the future of network effects. So I've been studying this, this effect for a while. Uh, I, I'm pretty close with the most important academics on the team. So I did two courses recently with them, Andre Hashio, Julian Wright, two academics, one from Boston University, the other for Singapore. They are also early stage investors, but I'm, I have been studying so much about network effects that uh, for me, it's one of the most business to teams of the investors and the companies. And, and I think that by default, network effects are really related with marketplace. So I'm really into marketplaces. For me, this model is beautiful and a lot of time it leads for monopolistic markets. Uh, right, currently, me and Estella as, as well, Laura, uh, we have been investigating the vertical SaaS. So when you create a SaaS for a specific narrow sector, and we have we are really interested in this trend because we can see the the combination of software as a service that we love it as Tela, but with the transactional side of it, the financial service. And I studied for a long time the creators economy. I I'm still have I'm still studying. Uh, we haven't invested in this area. Uh, I haven't invested personally, but. It's something that I'm, I'm, I'm really interested because I think that there is this attention uh, change, but I'm still not aware which platform will be the dominant or if the main winner of this category will be like Instagram and TikTok. Uh, but it's something that I'm deeply interested also. Interesting. All right. Um, thank you. Um, and then what do you think it's necessary to be a successful investor? So, you know, what are the things you watch out for? Uh, th this is a really good question because I'm, I'm like the searching of my superpowers. And this is actually, that's something that I'm th I've been thinking a lot. But I think that the first thing you need is to, 
entrepreneurs needs to respect you and they like to work with you so you need to add value and that that that's the most important thing because the best inter- as you said before you know the entrepreneurs pick you not you pick them the best ones so you need to be respected you you, you need to be a you, you need to be seen as a, a good potential partner uh, the second thing is that um, you, you you have to to uh, in my perspective in my view it's important to understand the thesis around it so the evolution thesis around each market so you need to understand and to be really close to what's happening in the world for example for a brazilian investor you need to know which companies are growing in us in asia in other countries uh, you need to have a great communication skill that's something that's pretty important for you as an investor and you need to create your superpower it can be as you said hiring it can be i add on product you can be the most well connected investor in the market but you need to create a edge to you you can be a really good content creator you have you can have a great audience but you you need i, I think that to cross the chasm as investor you need to cre- to to create and develop a superpower i'm still f- searching for my own does it make sense yeah, for you interesting oh i know uh, I, it does 100%. I think it's just the, the, the finding your superpowers though as an investor is extremely important because you want to be Michael Jordan playing basketball, Usain Bolt running, right? Uh, and then just triple, you know, double, 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 double down 100% on your superpowers. You don't want to be um, Michael Jordan playing baseball. You know, you want to be playing basketball until you die and then just keep getting better and better and better at some of these superpowers, right? Um, and um, because then you just become a recognized force. The only thing you got to do is just pick a superpower that companies will always need in perpetuity. This is why mine are fundraising, hiring, and public rela- public relations. These are three things I'm very good at, and they will always need. Um, I, I also, I find that, you know, um, you can have niche things. Oh, the best... Uh, you know, marketplace person or the best acquisition X, Y, and Z. And these are also very relevant folks. But in the end, forming your individual brand as an investor built on top of your superpowers is a fundamental skill that's very, very necessary, specifically in a world in which you're playing the game in a more generalist way. We at Atman, at least, have made uh, many, inter- we, have man- had, had, we have had many internal debates about, should we go full generalist, like how I used to be in my previous uh, chapters, and we decided not to be full, fully generous. So we, you know, we have uh, four themes that we care, which are very similar to the things you're doing. So it's ultimately right business B two B, everything B two B, so be SaaS, can be you know, marketplaces and so forth. Then we got commerce, which again could also be marketplace. You know, any exchange of goods for a certain amount of capital. That includes also logistics, right? It would also include aspects of urban urban mobility as well. It, the, the themes it's, themselves can be general but and can go very deep. Uh, then anything consumer and then anything fintech that includes crypto, that's it. So in general, right, you, you're not going to have healthcare. You're not going to have education. You're not going to have real estate. And I am very glad that we're not playing under any of these games because in the end, the um, uh, the bar for intellectual curiosity needs to be you know that we put inside the out of the conversation we've had it's like Sunday morning you're grabbing a fresh cup of coffee the sun is shining and you're gonna read something are you excited about reading anything that is there on the fundraising deck for the fund within the themes and you the if the answer is not yes. And, and, and not just a little yes, it needs to be like a fuck yeah. Um, then 
um, we should not be investing in any of these markets. So that's why we eliminated all these other things because um, we are not interested in, in, in certain markets like that and or, nor we are specialists and we are specialists in other things. So, so that's how the, at least we've made our decisions. You know, in the end, you work very hard to make your life easier. Yes. <laughs> so, so that's important. Absolutely. That's really important. And that's something that I think a lot about it because uh, as I, I do have an investor background, you know, I wasn't an entrepreneur. So I need to think think on teams that I'm really good at. And to be really good, I need to be really passionate about it. I need to do that. I, I need to read about it on my Sunday morning, you know. So I, 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 I have to have my focus on, on some areas. Interesting. And... Um... Um, do you have any particular, uh, this is a question that we always ask uh, at the end of the episode, so ultimately any particular rituals or morning habits that uh, you enjoy and you find um, that make you better? Um, I don't have like a strictly daily routine. I divide my, my routine into the week. So I'm a big fan of Carl Newport and the deep work. Uh, book so for example uh, I don't have like every day 6 a.m. I will do sports or I will do other thing but yeah. yes right. exactly <laughs> exactly exactly that's great for yeah. just those just listening we are now showing each other uh, <laughs> that we have the same book yeah. within arm's reach of our desks <laughs> uh, I, I'm a big fan of Cold Newport so my week is divided into shallow and deep work for example Wednesday is the deep work day for me and I just love it but on Monday I have several meetings with entrepreneurs and internal meetings with the team so it's a shallow day and so during that I insert some activities that I do daily but not exactly at the same time but I, for example, I exercise almost every day. That's pretty important for me. That's really important for my well-being to do exercises. Um, and another another habit is reading. So every day I read at least one hour, not only books but also articles. And um, I have a, a a habit that's really good. That's that's listening daily stock. So almost every day I, I listen to the daily stock podcast from Ryan Holiday. It's, it's it's something that I, I really like to start my day uh, doing that. Sorry, you mean, Ryan Holiday, the, the, the author on Stoicism and so forth? Yes, yes. He has a podcast, Daily Stock. Mm -hmm. and yep. it, no, I have his, literally his calendar on my desk as well, the uh, Stoic, yes. uh, the Daily Stoic <laughs> calendar. So I, again, I think interesting. Uh, yes, he has a podcast and uh, I, I really like to listen almost daily. And of course, writing. Like I don't write every day, but every week I do write like four, five, six hours, and so I I I plan my week on the on Sunday and I try to insert this type of activities, and uh, during my week. Nice, well, oh, very good. Do you have any other messages that you'd like to relay in terms of you know folks that are just listening in and thinking about getting a job in venture, um, and you know any any sort of uh, general but uh, helpful um, advice as well. Um, I, I, you know, I love the, the Mark Suster framework was very good, but maybe something that resonates specifically to you. Um, I think that the bar is so much higher right now to enter inventory. It was easier when I wanted to enter. So right now, a lot of brilliant folks are trying to, to join this market. And I think that you, you really need to be passionate about it. So you need to prove it. So if you love this market, start to write, start to talk with people. As Pedro said, give more than receive right now, but prove that you try, try to, to consume all the possible content in the internet about it. And that's my advice. The other one is subscribe to Abril newsletter that's my own newsletter <laughs> <laughs> i talk a, a lot about venture capital and, and these are my two advice but you know you have to be passionate about it so um, that that's a, you have to be curious and you have to be passionate that's great 
well, when you come to Miami, I want to play tennis with you because I have just started it and I suck, so it's going to be good. <laughs> um, and then um, um, naturally, I enjoy putting myself in uncomfortable situations. So, uh, but uh, Lucas, I appreciate your time. It was great uh, learning a little bit more about you, uh, your path into venture. And um, thanks for coming on the show. Pedro, thank you very much. It was a big pleasure. For me, it's an honor to be here in the Never podcast that I have listened so many times. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks, Lucas. And uh, for those listening, you already know the whole thing. You can find us in all platforms. Please like, subscribe, help us train the algorithm. And uh, see you next time.